one year after the Gulf War ceasefire, the Discovery Channel is proud to present the following special presentation. August 1990, the Iraqi forces of Saddam Hussein invade Kuwait. By January, America enters a war in the Middle East. One year later, the key players in Operation Desert Storm are gathered for the first time, brought together by former Assistant Secretary of Defense Richard Perrow. Now resident fellow for the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., Pearl conducted exclusive interviews with the Gulf War's top command and organized the Institute's panel discussions of the conflict and its aftermath. Policymakers and military leaders offer a day-by-day -day account, the futile negotiations, the tense preparations for combat, and the battles in the air and on the ground. The Gulf Crisis, the road to war. In our first episode, top government officials remember August 1st, 1990, the day Saddam Hussein's army invaded Kuwait. And they describe the frantic week that followed as America and its allies struggled to agree on a response. The American Enterprise Institute panel discussion is led by Harvard Law School professor Arthur Miller. Charles. Where were you? I was in Aspen, Colorado, where I just arrived with Mrs. Thatcher, who was there for a meeting with the President the following day. The action moves to Aspen, Colorado, where President Bush and British Prime Minister Thatcher are to discuss an invasion that Thatcher has already condemned as absolutely unacceptable. President left for Aspen, he had some understanding of uh, the uh, state of our planning and what uh, possibilities existed. Not specific options, but a range of, of possibilities that uh, he should he should consider as he thought about this in the course of his trip to Aspen and back. And the President and I discussed it at length going out to, uh, to Aspen and especially the significance of what had happened uh, more than simply one country invading another little country. That what, what did it all really mean? President and Mrs. Thatcher met in Ambassador Cato's Ranch. That's a slightly unlikely place. Uh, tucked up in the hills, 10 miles outside Aspen. It was a, a relaxed uh, meeting. It, a large room, comfortable room, just the President and Mrs. Thatcher and General Scowcroft, and, and I was there too. The President was ready for what Mrs. Thatcher came with, which was the same idea that this that this is more than just another case of a border incursion or something. This has great significance. So there was a meaning of mind of two. They were both heading in the same direction and they tended to reinforce each other. It's been said that Mrs. Thatcher had to put backbone into the prison. That's just wrong. I mean, they both arrived there absolutely determined that this was something which could not be tolerated. I think the, the genuine sense of outrage was the thing I remember most strikingly on the part of both of them that this should have happened. I think also, a slight feeling of history, a, a memory of what had happened when in the 1930s we had failed to move to protect small countries when they had been invaded. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait defies every principle for which the United Nations stands. If we let it succeed, no small country can ever feel safe again. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. President Bush gave a midday speech that day, which uh, ironically involved the Middle East. The strategic essence was to change the focus of our defense planning from a global war with the Soviet Union to dealing with regional conflicts. And in fact, in our secret planning, the, the regional conflicts that were of the greatest concern were in the Persian Gulf, like an Iraqi invasion of Saudi Arabia. This had been planned to be a major unveiling of a new defense strategy, but of course no one noticed in all the other things going on. The brutal aggression launched last night against Kuwait illustrates my central thesis. Notwithstanding the alteration in the Soviet threat, the world remains a dangerous place with serious threats to important U.S. interests wholly unrelated to the earlier patterns of the U.S.-Soviet relationship. 
And the two of them then drove back to the ranch and they had a further discussion there. And the second time, I think, the, the, the military aspects were rather more in their mind. Not, as I recall it at that stage, the need perhaps to use force to eject Iraq from Kuwait. Uh, what were the Iraqis likely to do? Were they simply going to stop at Kuwait? Could they, uh, uh, could they just continue marching on down the border into the Saudi oil fields, which were right in the line of march, and, and uh, what, in fact, could be done uh, to stop that sort of a thing? What's going on the golf? Any problems? No, I have a long talk with King Fahd just now. What do you want? No, just, we're just reviewing options. It, it's now August 3rd, and the second 8 a.m. NSC meeting takes place. You had the three senior people at the meeting besides the president. You had you know, Brent Scowcroft, Larry Edelberger, and Dick Cheney. Each gave a several minute statement at the beginning. I had told the president that I was, I was concerned and I thought we had to get over the significance of this in the world that we were, that we were living in and that if he didn't mind, I would do what I don't usually do at NSC meetings, and that is open the meeting with a statement of the, of the larger significance of this. And, uh, and he said, well, maybe I should do that. And, and I remember saying, no, I think it's better that I do, and you sit back and let the debate develop. So, so that's what I did, and, and try to set it in a, in a broader stage of the overall significance to U.S vital interest of what had happened. I told President Bush <clears throat> what was brought home by Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait was that uh, he did not have to take Saudi Arabia in order to dominate the Gulf. Once he had Kuwait, he had uh, some 20% of the world's oil reserves and he had the largest army in the neighborhood. He was in a position to dictate policy to everybody else in the Gulf. The general thrust of what I said, which was again, uh, after working it out with Bob, was essentially that Mr. President, this is a far more important issue than simply the invasion of Kuwait, important as that is. This is, in its own way, the first real test of this new world order that we're trying to put together. And if, it is, if this aggression is permitted to proceed, uh, it sets a whole, the, all the wrong standards for that new world order. It sends messages to the Qaddafi, the Kim Il-sungs, etc., that if you will, with the collapse of the bipolar world, with the removal of one of the two superpowers. Uh, in fact, perhaps the rules of the game have changed and the pipsqueaks like Saddam Hussein can do more rather than less because they aren't constrained by their big brother. And under these circumstances, it's absolutely essential that the U.S. collectively, if possible, but individually, if necessary, uh, not only put a stop to this aggression, but roll it back. He's a large geopolitical state. Well, you know, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> However you assess the stakes, this was going to be a turning point. It was the first test of what you might call the post-Cold War era, and everybody knew that there was just a sense, a palpable sense of history in the room. Is, is it your sense on the third that the president was sharing these views as expressed? Well, very much so. The only re reason the president held back, I think, based on everything I know from the day, was that once the president speaks at a meeting, it, it certainly sets the tone and it, it can inhibit what other people are prepared to say. You might say. You might say. <laughs> <laughs> there was a period of time there, and it was a lot longer than any of us in the Defense Department liked, where all we had there were basically aircraft and some lightly armed ground troops, and nothing on the ground that really could stop large tank columns as they move forward. In some ways, I thought, for a lot of us, those were probably the worst couple of days of the crisis, once you got over the initial shock of the invasion, where the gap between what Iraq had or could bring to bear and what we actually had on the ground or in the area, the gap was probably the largest it ever was for the entire crisis. <laughs> Intense negotiations continue, but Saddam Hussein refuses to back down in New World Order, part two of our three-part series of The Gulf Crisis, The Road to War.